Good morning. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who came before you. If you have uh, young ones with you uh, between the ages of five and nine and would like for them to be a part of Children's Chapel today, uh, now's the time for them to gather at the back door. They will, uh, they'll, they'll go and, and hear a message that's very similar to the one that we're hearing uh, here this morning, and then they will come back. They'll be brought back in uh, at the end of the message before we come to the Lord's table, so they'll be back with you uh, in the pews for the sacrament. But well, we are beginning a new series of messages uh, this morning uh, that'll take us for the next couple of months, probably pretty much take us right up to maybe second week of June uh, on the Beatitudes. And, and the Beatitudes are the section of scripture that Carl just read for us. Uh, what that means is that for the next couple of months, we'll be looking at sort of one verse at a time from, from this passage that we've just heard. The Beatitudes... Um, are, are part of a, a larger section of Scripture. Uh, they're part of a sermon, really, from Jesus uh, that he preached with his disciples and his followers up on a hill, uh, probably a hill that was looking out over the Sea of Galilee, which is the picture that you're looking at right now. Um, it's, it's typically referred to as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's, uh, it's recorded for us in Matthew chapters 5 through seven, and the Beatitudes are part of that sermon. They're the beginning of that sermon. They're really the first 11 11 or 12 verses of the sermon itself. That's what we we just heard. The the word Beatitudes comes from a Latin uh, translation. Latin is not the original language of the New Testament. That would be Greek. But when the Roman church translated the Greek New Testament into their language, it, they, they, well, actually, I don't know that it was their language, but they translated it into Latin first, and the words that appear at the beginning of each of these verses in Latin are, are a combination of the words beati sun, which basically is translated blessings or blessed, and so that's where, that's where we get the name of, of, of what we're talking about here. As, as we, we go through this section over the next couple of months, we'll be looking at each of these blessings individually. And so we'll, we'll be unpacking them one by one, and that means that, that we'll, as I said, we'll just be looking at one verse at a time. I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about this. If, if you've been with us for the last few months when we walked through uh, Joshua, you know that we've been looking at really big sections of Scripture, and there's lots, you know, lots of material, lots of stuff to talk about. Um, this is going to be a series where each sermon is sort of one verse. And so I'm, <laughs> i got to figure out what to say about one verse. For, so, so you might be thinking, well, maybe the sermons will be shorter. <clears throat> Pray. Pray for that. That might be nice. What I want to do today, though, is I, I want to give you sort of an, an overview of 
of the Sermon on the Mount in general. Because, as I said, the, the Beatitudes are part of the Sermon on the Mount, but I think they have a very special place in their relationship to the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. So I want to try to help us understand how the Beatitudes fit into the Sermon and what the Beatitudes are going to be teaching us. And so as we do this, as you might imagine, we'll look at three things here this morning. I want us to look at the beauty of the Sermon on the Mount. I want us to look at the conviction of the Sermon on the Mount and then the point of the Sermon on the Mount. So the beauty of it, the conviction of it, and then the beauty, I'm sorry, and then the, 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 the point of it. So let's start with, with the beauty of the sermon. I think, I think as, as we, as, as a church, historically have, have thought about the Beatitudes, my, my, my guess is that for many of you, as, as Carl read this for us, you were probably thinking, I've heard this before. This is somewhat familiar. Uh, this is a pretty famous section of Scripture. It might be one of the, the most famous sections in, in the whole Bible. But I think what we've, we've tended to do as a church is we've tended to have sort of a romantic view of, of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount because, for one thing, the Sermon on the Mount is, is kind of poetic. There's poetry in it. It's not all poetry, but there is poetry that's sort of woven through it and, it, and it sounds like a different kind of literature because it is for the most part. But I think also we, we romanticize this section of Scripture as well because it presents to us a picture of life that is kind of pretty. It's kind of beautiful. It's attractive. It's the kind of life that I think we would all love to be a part of. If you have a Bible, if you have you know, access to, to something on your phone, I want to encourage you to follow along with me. I'm not going to put the whole Sermon on the Mount on the wall behind me. But if you, if you have access to a Bible, then, then I want to invite you to just kind of open it to Matthew chapter 5, and I want to just kind of touch on some of the high points through uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of this book so that you get a, a little feel for the kinds of things that Jesus is going to be talking about here. Immediately following the Beatitudes, so where, where we pick up in verse 13, Jesus talks about the kind of impact that you and I can have in the world. He refers to us as salt and light. Salt, as, as most of you know, is a preservative. It's, it's an antidote to things like decay and spoilage when it comes to food. In the, in the ancient times, there was no refrigeration, and so what they would do is they would, they would basically rub meat down with salt, and that helped to preserve it, make it last longer. So in a sense, we, being salt in the world, are a preserving agent in the world. But not only is salt a preservative, salt also brings flavor, right? I mean, most of us tend to like food a little better when it has salt in it, because it has more flavor. Well, in many ways, as we are salt in the world, we have the opportunity to enrich the experience of life in this world for everyone around us. And then you have light. Light not only gets rid of darkness, but by it we see, right? We see what is. We see what is true. And not only do we see what is true, but we also see the truth about God and about our lives. And so, Jesus says that we will be salt and light in the world. Then he talks about the law. Imagine a world where the law of God is followed. Where everyone around you is obeying God's law. The world would be pretty good if we lived like that. Where people lived righteous lives. And then he gets very specific into a number of different kinds of of obedience or righteous living in light of God's law. He talks about anger. He basically equates hate with murder, which may seem a little bit harsh to us, but, but he says hate is what murder is made of. You've heard it said, do not commit murder, but I say anyone who hates 
their brother has already committed murder in their heart. He goes on and and does the same thing with lust. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say to you, anyone who lusts has already committed adultery in their heart. He's, He's saying that lust is what adultery is made of. You see, what Jesus does, it, it's, it's very important here, in a world that tended to focus on behavior, Jesus says that behavior is connected to something deeper. Behavior is connected to our hearts. You, you, you are probably familiar with another place where Jesus says, from, from the contents of your heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, it's, it's it's like our heart is like a toothpaste tube. When you squeeze a toothpaste tube, what comes out of it? What's in it, right? Toothpaste. Because when you, when you, when you put something under pressure, what comes out of it is what was in it. Well, what comes out of us? What's in us? So if adultery comes out of you, it's because lust is in you. There's, there's a, and it, Paul Tripp describes it this way. He says there's a connection between the fruit that we bear in our lives and the roots that are going down deep into the soil of our lives. A root-fruit connection. If you don't like the fruit that's coming out of you, you don't just cut it off. That won't solve the problem. The problem is that you have something going on in the roots of your life. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus is saying here. Then he talks about keeping your word, speaking the truth, doing what you say. Then he goes on and talks about not retaliating when when people offend you, when people wrong you. It's a whole whole part of the sermon here about how to respond when, when you are wronged. He talks about turning the other cheek. Turning the other cheek is is, is a picture and, and was, was very much a part of, of how people greeted one another in ancient society. They would greet each other, in, in, in some cases, by kissing each other on the cheek. But they would, they would turn the cheek twice. And so he's saying, look, if you, if you offer someone your cheek to greet them in kindness and they strike you, don't retaliate. Don't respond in kind. What he actually is saying is, even when that happens, continue to move toward them in relationship, which would be to turn the other cheek, because that was the rest of the greeting dance that you would do. Well, they might hit me back. Yes, they might. But you see what Jesus is saying. He's saying, move toward people even when they harm you. That's pretty hard teaching. Then he talks about, you think that's hard teaching. He talks about loving our enemies. Anyone can love their friends. Anyone can love people who are nice to us. But Jesus says, love even your enemies. He talks about giving to those in need, generously, sacrificially. He talks about forgiving those who sin against us. That's a big part of the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer is, is, is in the midst of this sermon. But a big part of the Lord's Prayer is forgiving others as the Lord has forgiven us. And he talks about not condemning others. He's not saying don't think critically. He's not, he's not saying move through life without evaluating truth and falsehood and right and wrong. He's not saying stop thinking but he's saying, don't have a critical spirit. Don't have a judgmental spirit. Don't be someone who condemns other people and rushes to conclusions about what's going on in other people's roots just because you see their fruit. So if you think about it, this is a pretty beautiful sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It describes a world that that we would love to live in. I mean, how would you love to live in a world where no one no one responds to 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 wrongdoing with anger and retaliation? 
where people, where people don't fester the lust in their, in their hearts. Where people keep their word, they speak the truth, they do what they say. Where they love those that they perceive to be their enemies. Where, where people give generously to those in need. Where people are quick to forgive and not just harbor resentment. It would be a pretty beautiful life, wouldn't it? A pretty beautiful world that we would live in. He's describing life in the kingdom of God. Do you see that? that he, he's describing, this is the life that I've come to bring. And this is the life that I want to give you for those who will surrender to me, Jesus is saying, as your king. When you surrender to me, Jesus is saying, this is the life that I've come to bring. This is the life that I want to give you, that you can live. It's attractive. It's desirable. But it's also complicated. Because as beautiful as this life and this speech is, not everyone finds it appealing. Back in 1987, um, there was a, a Christian woman named Virginia Stem Owens. I, th I think she's still living. But she wrote an article that appeared in a, a, a periodical called the Reformed Journal. Virginia Stem Owens uh, is a, a Christian author and a, uh, a professor of literature. She, she taught at Texas A&M University. And, and in this article that she published in the Reformed Journal, she had given an assignment to her students at Texas A&M. Uh, it was a literature class, and so she gave this assignment. I want, she wanted them to read the Sermon on the Mount. And then she gave the assignment to write a, a little essay, a response to the sermon. And since most of the sermon, the, the students in her class tended to come from sort of middle class, conservative families, this was Texas after all, she assumed and expected that most of them would be pretty familiar with the Sermon on the Mount and that they would generally have sort of a, a favorable response to it. But she was surprised to find that the majority of them actually had a markedly negative response to it. And, and she found that, that part of the negativity was connected to, to what she detected as sort of a general resistance to religion. This was a secular university literature class, and they didn't expect to be assigned reading from the Bible. And so part of their, she, she perceived part of their response as being, what are we doing here? You know, we came here to study literature. I signed up this class to study literature. I didn't, I didn't come here to study the Bible. So there was sort of a, a resistance to that. But, but she also picked up another kind of theme, and that is the conviction of the sermon bothered them. And that's our second point here. We've talked about the beauty of the sermon. I want to talk to you a little bit about the conviction of the Sermon on the Mount. She, she shares a couple of quotes in this, in this article from her students that they wrote in, in some of their essays. One of, for the first one that she quotes from goes like this. The student said, I did not like the essay, Sermon on the Mount. It was hard to read, and it made me feel like I had to be perfect, and no one is. Another student said, what this preaches is extremely strict, and it allows for almost no fun because you're always trying to figure out what's sin and what's not sin. And then a third one, the things asked in this sermon are absurd. To look at a woman as, I, as adultery, that's the most extreme, stupid, unhuman statement I've ever heard. Maybe you can relate to this. Maybe as you read the Sermon on the Mount, you hear me speaking of it as a beautiful thing, and it's wonderful, and you read it, and you're going, I don't know, I don't know how I can do this. How can anyone do this, right? Here's, here's what her, her assessment was. 
of her students. She said, this was not exactly intellectual agnosticism talking here, which is typically the perceived foe of the faith. This was the disciples asking, who then can be saved? When Jesus said to them, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Is that familiar? Do you remember Jesus saying that? When the disciples respond to that, they're like by saying, well, who then can be saved? You hear what she's saying? She's saying that their response was basically, no one can do this. No one can live like this. Sure, it'd be great to be treated this way by others, but this is unattainable. Nobody can, nobody can actually live this way. It's too strict. It requires perfection. And as we all know, and as we all love to say, nobody's perfect. Here's what we need to see. As beautiful as the picture of living is that's laid out in the Sermon on the Mount, it is not a TED Talk. It is not a lecture on how to make your life better. If you just apply these principles to your life, you will have the life that you've always dreamed of living. That's not what it is. If anything, the bar is too high for us. And it shows us our need. It shows us our shortcomings, our weakness, our, ability, our inability to renovate our own lives. And none of us like to be shown these things, do we? Here, let's, let's form a line and you come up here and I'll tell you everything that's wrong with you. You're, you're going to go that way. You're, you're not going to come to the front. But there's a sense in which the Sermon on the Mount kind of does that. It holds up this wonderful picture of righteousness. And, if, and if, you, if you look at it as a picture, it's beautiful. But if you look at it like a mirror, it's not so pretty. It's convicting. But having said this, that it's not just something to improve our lives. Here, here's, here's what I want to show you. If we're cynical, then, then we might look at this and say, well, this is kind of cruel what Jesus is doing here. He's giving us this, this beautiful picture of, of the way that we could live, except we can't, right? It's what life could look like, but it's not possible. So, so it's sort of like, why does Jesus even show us this in the first place? I mean, if he's, if he's trying to show us this beautiful picture of what life could be, and then the reality is it can't be because we don't have the ability. Why is he teasing us? I don't think that's what he's doing. It's important for us to see that the Beatitudes fit with the, the bigger sermon. And, and, and I, want, I want to try to show us how it fits. The majority of the Sermon on the Mount is about how to live, how to act, how to behave. It's what to do. But the Beatitudes at the beginning are, are not so much about how to act. They are more about who we need to be. Do you hear the difference between what to do and what, and what to be, how to act, and, and, and what's the, sub, of the substance of who you are? The Beatitudes are about being, about being poor in spirit, about being mournful about being meek, about being hungry and thirsty for righteousness, about being merciful, about being pure in heart, about being peacemakers, being persecuted for righteousness. It's all about being. But here's what I want you to see. It is only the person who has this kind of being that can actually accomplish the living that is described in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to be the person in the Beatitudes in order to live the life described in the Sermon. 
Here's the question. Who has this being? You know the answer. It's Jesus. Right? He's the one who has this being, and he is the one who has lived this life. But this brings us to the point of the sermon, the point of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes ultimately describe Jesus, and therefore, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount describes Jesus' life. And we're going to unpack all the different ways over the next couple of months that Jesus fulfills these descriptions as we work through the Beatitudes. But the point I'm trying to make to you is the point of this series is not going to be about following the example of Jesus. I know we sometimes make it that, don't we? We say, Jesus lived this wonderful life, therefore to be a follower of Jesus means that you follow his example. We get bracelets that say, what would Jesus do? And we try to live our life following as, as if the Christian life was following the example of Jesus. And I'm kind of saying to you, I don't think that's what the Christian life is. The Christian life is not trying to follow the example of someone else in our own strength. If you remember from last week, I know Easter was a long time ago now, but the Christian life is about being reborn. It's not about being renovated. This is not HGTV for our life. This is being reborn. It's about having new life. It's about being born again. It's about being new creatures. The old has gone. The new has come. As worthy as Jesus is that we would follow his example, the Christian life is about being new creatures. But what is the new? What, what is the new like? I want to read a, a verse to you that it is probably familiar to many of you. It's not connected to the Sermon on the Mount, but it's from Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28, which many of you can quote. But it's the Apostle Paul, it's the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul, and this is, this is what he says. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. Does that sound familiar to many of you? Here's what we often do with this verse. We take this verse and we sprinkle on it what I might call Disney dust. Okay, we, we take this, this verse and we sprinkle Disney World on it, so that basically what it means is God is working everything together so that we will live happily ever after. Right? We say, whatever happens, doesn't matter how hard you're facing things today, you know, tomorrow might, you know, be hard and whatever, it's, it's, things aren't going right, it's okay, hang on. God is working all things together for your good. And you're going to love it. And we define good based on what we think would be a happy outcome to help us live happily ever after. So, so let, me, let me give you kind of an example of this. And this is, this is nobody's real life, okay? I mean, it might be, but I don't know them, okay? So I'm just making this up just to give you kind of an example of how we sometimes do this, okay? So... A little over a year ago, I ran a red light, and I T-boned another car. Don't worry, everybody was okay. But my car was damaged in, in the accident, obviously, and so my car had to go into the body shop. And in dealing with the body shop, I met this cute girl who works as the receptionist to the body shop. And so I asked her out. And, and we went out on a couple of dates, and we started dating, and about six months later, we got engaged, and then about six months after that, we got married. So, if I hadn't run that red light, 
then I never would have met this cute girl and gotten married. Right? Yeah, all oh, right. It's fiction, okay? <laughs> I just made it up. I didn't meet Sandy at a body shop. But do you see how we do that, though? We, we look at things that happen, and then we kind of follow along, and we get to a happy ever after kind of an outcome, and we say, that's what this verse means. Because we say, ta-da, if I hadn't run that red light, then I never would have gotten married. God works all things together for good. We quote Romans 8, 28. Listen, I'm not saying that God never works like that. I think God is working through all things. I believe that God is sovereign over every detail. So yes, there are times when something like that can happen, and, I'm, and that's fine to say, I think God orchestrated this. But, but here's the point I'm making. Romans 28, Romans 8, 28, is not a puzzle for us to try to figure out every day or each week what is God's purpose that He is bringing about, right? As if God's purpose is a mystery, as, God, as if God's purpose is something I have to figure out today and next week and next month. The purpose that, that Paul is talking about in Romans 8.28 is actually defined and explained in Romans 8.29. Because he goes on to say, this is the purpose. For those whom he foreknew, meaning God has known us before we've even been alive. Before creation, God has known. Our life is his idea. So those whom he has foreknown, he has also predestined, and all the Presbyterians said amen, because we love this word, but God has, has known us from eternity past, he has had plans for our lives from eternity past, but listen to what he has predestined us for. He has predestined us that we would be conformed to the image of his son. That's what predestination is about. And that's the purpose for which God is working all things together. Do you see the connection there? You can't separate verse 28 from verse 29. That's what new looks like. That's what being reborn looks like. It's what this new creation is about. God's purpose in all things is to make you and me into a new creation, a new being. And that new being is exactly like Jesus. It's the being that is described by the be attitudes. When you read the Beatitudes, what you're reading is not only a picture of what Jesus is like, you're also looking at a picture of what God is making you to be. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful picture. It's a masterpiece. And He's making you into a new being that will live like the life described in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. And that is beautiful as well. So that is what we're going to be doing over the next couple of months, is unpacking what this being looks like in light of the living that Jesus has called us to. There was a, a point where Jesus comes to his disciples and he he makes a statement that was very provocative. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And, and it was a very perplexing thing for the disciples to hear, as you might imagine. Some of the followers of Jesus heard that and they kind of said, that, that's enough. That, that's all I can take. And they began to walk away from Jesus. They no longer followed him. 
I think the reason that Jesus often did things like this, there were, there were other times when Jesus would say things that were very difficult to hear, difficult to understand, difficult to process. And I think part of the reason Jesus did this is because he wanted people to wrestle with him. He wanted people to go deeper. He wanted people to meditate on what he was saying and really consider what are the implications of following Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus? But I think another reason that Jesus often spoke in these ways is that he wanted to help his disciples and and by extension help us to see that following Jesus isn't only about understanding and agreeing. Sometimes we follow Jesus even when we don't understand. Isn't that your experience? You know, if we only follow Jesus when we understand And when we agree, do you know that that's not really obedience? That's just agreement. Think about that with your kids. Those of you who have kids, and if you don't have kids, think about when you were a kid. If our kids only obey their parents when they fully understand and they agree, that's not obedience. That's colleagues right? That's, that's us being peers. And we know there are times, I mean, we're happy for our kids to understand. We want our kids to understand. We want our kids to agree. But you know, there are times when our kids don't have to understand and they don't have to agree. We just need to get them out of the road, right? You need to get out of the street so you don't get hit by a car. I don't need to have a conversation and a debate with you so you help you understand and agree. You just need to do what I said. And that's not a dictatorship, that's love. So following Jesus is sometimes like that, isn't it? Jesus saw some of the disciples turning away and going off, and he turns to the 12, and he says, how about you? Are you going to leave too? And Peter spoke up, I think, for all of them and said, where else are we going to go? Because you alone have the words of eternal life. I think what what Peter was saying was, yeah, I don't understand what you're talking about here. This whole eating your flesh, drinking your blood. But even though we don't understand, we're going to follow you. We're going to trust you. You know, there are things about the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount that you and I are not going to fully understand. We don't under, we're not going to understand how God is in the process of conforming us after the image of Jesus. We don't fully understand how that works. We don't fully understand how long it takes. We don't understand if it's going to be painful or not. Probably we're kind of fearful that it probably will involve some pain, right? And we might be tempted to say, I don't know if I really want to do this. But a follower of Jesus says, even though I don't understand, even though it may be hard, where else am I going to go? You alone, Lord, have the words of eternal life. Not too much longer after Jesus made that statement about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he sat down with his disciples around the Passover table. And he said, you know, this lamb that we sacrifice and that we eat. This lamb that represents the the sin punished and, and, and atoned for, for the sins of Israel as they were leaving Egypt, as God brought them out of slavery. Everything that this lamb points to is fulfilled in my flesh, he said, in my death. That's what I want you to eat. I want you to eat this lamb. I want you to eat this meal. But from now on, I want you to know that it's me that this is pointing to. And then he took a cup of wine that represented the wrath of God poured out on the sins of the people. And he said, I want you to know that this cup is fulfilled in the shedding of my blood on the cross. That's what this is about. This isn't cannibalism. 
This isn't literally eating the body and drinking the blood of Jesus. This is about understanding that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it was His blood that was shed on the cross to cover us, that we might be acceptable, that when the Father looks at us and we are covered in the blood of Jesus, He sees His Son, whom He loves, with whom He is well pleased. And we are hidden in Him. We are covered by Him. If you're here today and and you're not sure you understand everything about what it means to follow Jesus, the message here is not, then this table isn't for you. No, I don't think think any of us fully understands everything that there is to understand about following Jesus. The question isn't, do you understand everything? Understanding is important. I'm not not trying to be down on understanding. I'm just saying, if you are, are somehow reluctant because you don't understand everything, It's unanimous. That's all of us. The question isn't, do you understand it all? The question is, even where you don't understand, are you willing to follow him? Are you willing to say with Peter, where else am I going to go? You have the words of eternal life. If you're here today and you don't believe, and you know you don't believe, or maybe you just don't, don't know what you believe, my message to you is, Don't just go through the motions with this table. This is not just something that we do. It's not empty. We do it by faith. We do it trusting Jesus as the one who has died for us. His body given, his blood shed. But if if there's things you don't understand, that's okay. Are you trusting him? Do you want to follow him? If you are, then this table is for you. If you're, if you're not yet at that place, or you're not sure, then I would say, stay where you are. I'm not saying do nothing, but wrestle with God. Use this time to wrestle with Him. Talk to Him. He says, ask, seek, knock. Those who ask, it will be given. Those who seek, find. If you knock, He says, I will open the door. So use this time to interact with God, wrestle with Him about what it means to follow Him. But if you're trusting Jesus, this table is for you. He says, come, this is my body, this is my blood which is given for you. Let me pray for us as we prepare to come. If the elders would would go ahead and come and I don't know that they hear us. Come on, let's pray. Father, thank you for preparing a table before us. We know that that it's not a table that's going to fill our stomach, but it's a table that you use to fill our hearts, to fill our, our spirit with your promises, with your truth. And Lord, we pray that you would set these elements apart from their common and ordinary use that we typically think of when we when we see these wafers, these crackers, and, and this grape juice. Lord, we pray that your spirit would come and that you would meet us here as we eat and drink by faith that your spirit would testify with and by these things in our hearts. Lord, we we thank you that you gave your life for us. You died. You physically died. Your body was given for our salvation and, and your side was pierced and you bled for us and your blood covers our sins. Lord, we want to come to you by faith, and we pray that you would strengthen us and meet us here, that we would commune with you and with each other. And so, please, meet us here as we eat and drink. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was...